So I'm almost finished with Hostetter's book, I Am a Strange Loop. Um, I wanted to touch on a few more issues that I was having. Um, it may just be my lack of understanding of what he's really trying to say, but um, it seems like... I'll just read uh, this little line here. The closing of the strange loop of human selfhood is deeply dependent upon the level-changing leap that is perception, which means categorization. So perception is categorization for him. And therefore, the richer and more powerful an organism's categorization, the more realized and rich itself will be. Conversely, the poorer an organism's repertoire of categories, the more impoverished itself will be. Um, and it seems like he's saying there that your level of selfhood depends on your intelligence, your ability to put the world into categories. And uh, I, that doesn't really seem, it doesn't fit right with me. I, I mean, something's missing. Like, what, what role does the heart play? In, in, the, in the size of the self, or the size of the soul, as Hofstadter says. You know, what about emotion? Um, that doesn't seem to have any role to play in his understanding of uh, perception and, and, and being a self, and feeling that sense of self. And um, this might be because, unlike uh, Varela and um, Maturana and their notion of cognition as the basis of life, in other words, an organism um, it's a cognitive system, otherwise it wouldn't be an organism, it wouldn't be alive. So cognition is um, a prerequisite for living, basically. Whereas for Hofstadter, cognition must be earned. You have to learn how to think. And, and that is sort of, it shows you that there's more of a mind-body dualism in Hofstadter than uh, Varela and Maturana. They're trying to get rid of that idea. Um, because it really seems like to me that Hofstadter is almost trying to rip the head off the body and what I mean by that is he wants he doesn't want the medium to have to determine what the intelligence can do in other words he wants intelligence to be this symbol manipulation that can exist abstractly um, you know and float off into space like an alien and leave the body behind the messy uh, organic you know goo of the brain He's saying you don't need that to understand how thinking works. Thinking is a higher level, higher level property, whereas um, Varela and Maturana want to say no. Thinking is biological. It's it's rooted in in the body and in the bodily processes. Um, so, and and Hofstadter refers to a, a child as a baby. He uses William James's phrase. Um, the baby is born into the world, uh, and it's a big, blooming, buzzing confusion of sensory input. And um, at my uh, at my university, UCF, there's a professor, um, Sean Gallagher, who is in, really into the embodiment stuff and uh, Merleau Ponty's work. And he corrected something in Merleau Ponty that that um, was similar to what William James has said here. Um, Merleau Ponty thought that when a child was born, it had no understanding of itself. And, and that therefore um, it didn't gain a body schema, as he called it, or a sense of um, being in a body and being able to control a body without thinking about it until a few years after birth. But um, what uh, Gallagher showed is this phenomenon called neonate initiation, which means that um, almost right after they're born, a baby can mimic the facial expressions of an adult or its parents. And this shows that it has a basic concept of self and that it's not a booming, buzzing confusion. Um, so in this sense, it shows that cognition is rooted in the body a lot earlier than, than uh, Hostetter here thinks, and, and William James, indeed. Um, and so in this, in this sense, Hofstadter is very, he's a Lockean blank slate kind of guy, and, and he wants to say that... Um, Knowledge is correct representation of the world, therefore it's based on our empirical experience. And we have no understanding of anything until we grow into the world and, and understand the connections between the objective events of, of the external world. And that that is what builds our knowledge. Um, so the brain... gives us the, the ability to leave the body because the brain is a collection of symbols and and later on in the in the book he starts talking about how 
Um, we build copies of other selves. If the self is nothing but this strange loop of self-referencing symbols, it doesn't only have to exist in my brain. It can exist in other people's brains, and other people can have copies of, and I can have copies of other people's uh, selves in my brain as well. Um, and he, he wants to say that there's no fundamental difference between a copy of someone else's self in my brain and their actual self, or it's not their actual, but their brain self, their version of themselves. So there's no difference between my copy and their copy of themselves, because there's no I. And if the I is just an illusion of self-referencing symbols, I can have, albeit a less accurate one than, the, than what's in the actual person's brain themselves, I, I can still carry this person with me, because the person, the I, is nothing but this collection of, of symbols. Um, and so the soul, or the I, for Hofstadter, can easily leave the body, because it has nothing to do with the body. But it does have something to do with the body in the sense that it never could arise, it never could emerge without the body. So, in that sense, um, the soul is not the body, but the body is the soul. So, ourselves are symbolic, which is, it's ourselves, our, our intelligence, our ability to categorize the world. And our knowledge, that knowledge of the world makes us who we are because the self is nothing but information. And of course, information can tra transcend the medium it is stored on, because it's like a uh, software, and you can load software on any hard disk, it doesn't matter. Um, so our brains are like universal machines in that sense. Um, and later on, um, he, he sort of uh, tries to answer what my criticism would be but I don't think he does a good job of it. I mean, basically, he's trying to respond to, look, you haven't solved the hard problem of consciousness, which is basically how do external structures turn into internal experiences, you know? How do, how do my brain states turn into phenomenal, phenomenological uh, experiential states? And his answer to that is basically, look, the phenomenological experiential state is an illusion. Because what's real is the brain state. Um, and I don't see how, what basis he has to really say that. Um, because the, the, for me, I see, okay, I'm having this phenomenological experience. Let's say I'm a, I'm a scientist, I'm a physicist, and then I use my experience to come to the conclusion that there's a physical world out there. Well, that's, that's a construction based on my experience. My experience was first. And then I can't somehow, based on... Um, a deduction from my experience, say, oh, my experience isn't real, only what I experience with my experience is real, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, so so he, he asked the question uh, that a skeptic might ask, who reads the symbols in their configurations? Who feels the symbols come alive? Where's the counterpart of the reader of the symbols in, in, in the brain? And um, his answer is basically no answer. Um, he says, well, if, if this is true, that there must be a reader of the symbols, then it's going to turn into an infinite regress. Because, you know, who's reading the reader of the reading? And, and which one is really you? Because the skeptics are kicking the problem upstairs instead of settling for the idea that symbol-level brain activity that mirrors external events is consciousness. They insist that internal events of brain activity must be perceived if consciousness is to arise. And this runs the risk of setting up an infinite regress and thus moving further and further away from an answer to the riddle of consciousness. And his answer is basically, look, there is no reader of the symbols. Symbols trigger more symbols, and the self-referencing of symbols gives rise to consciousness. But that to me is a non-explanation. I don't, I don't understand how that, that, that. He is the one saying that there's an infinite regress in that sense. There's an infinite self-referencing of external symbols upon external symbols, but that still doesn't explain how any internal experience is going to arise. And it's easy just to say, well, that's because it's an illusion. There is no internal experience. But then, how does a scientist study the world? I mean, I, I don't understand. You can't negate your own ability to be aware of the physical world itself, I mean, um, so I don't know.
I need some responses on this stuff because I'm not understanding it well. 